Yeah. All right. Well, give somebody a high five real quick. Tell them welcome to church this morning. Come on, you had not had a chance to do that yet. We've been worshiping. All right. Awesome. Hey, if you have your worship guide, you can turn it over on the back. Follow along with me this morning. And uh, I got a little echo. They're working on it back there. And uh, you can follow along with us. Fill in a couple blanks. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons we like to give you the handout is obviously, uh, you know, statistics say when you hear something, you retain a certain percentage. When you read it, you, you retain, a little bit, uh, retain a little bit more. And when you, when you hear it, read it, and write it, you, you even retain uh, more. And so we like to give you that opportunity so you can um, uh, hopefully receive and retain as much as possible this morning. But another reason is so you can take it with you, take it home, and uh, it is a great resource to use throughout this week for your devotion. If you don't already have a devotion you use, take the handout home, and each morning or each evening or whatever time you set aside for your quiet time, just get that, uh, pull that handout out and, and begin to go through it, maybe point by point, verse by verse, and allow the Lord to just uh, speak to you even more. Uh, we're going to conclude our Anxious for Nothing series this morning. A little different than I had planned, uh, because I believe that this week the Lord just really kind of dropped something on me. I want to share it with you today. I knew it was for me when he when he dropped it to, in my spirit, but I also felt immediately like, hey, this is how uh, we need to wrap up this series. is It's just a very simple, um, what I believe would be a "Thus saith the Lord," and I'll I'll share that with you a little later. But let's, uh, if you got your hand out, let's read our passage that's been our kind of our text for the whole uh, series. It's our foundational text. It's found in Philippians chapter 4, and it says this in verse 6. I'm not going to read the whole passage. We did that the first three weeks uh, last week, and today I'm just going to read you kind of the, the, um, the meat of the passage. It says in verse 6 of Philippians chapter 4, Do not worry about anything, but pray and ask God for everything you need. Always giving thanks. And God's peace. Come on, somebody say God's peace. Now that's not just and peace. I'm glad it doesn't say and peace. Um, because there's a lot of, you know, there's peace that a lot of different things can give you temporarily for a while. But he says if you'll, if you'll not worry and be anxious about anything, you'll pray about everything, you'll learn to be a thankful person in your life. He says God's peace, which is so great we cannot understand it will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Have you ever heard the devil whisper in your ear that you're not going to make it? <laughs> Come on, have you ever just had that little, and, and it's, it's the devil, man, just whispering in your ear, hey, you're not going to make it. This is too, too tough. The situation is too bad. Your need is too great. You're not going to make it. I believe that is really kind of the, uh, the biggest indicator of, of anxiety and dealing with anxiety is when you begin to hear that little voice in your mind, your heart, your spirit that says, you know what, you're not going to make it. You worry, you fear, a lot of things happen. This week as I was thinking about this and even in my own life, just kind of had a moment, and I'm sure you have these moments where it's not planned, you don't do it on purpose, you probably wouldn't do it if you could help it. But you find yourself maybe sitting, things get quiet for a few minutes, your mind starts wondering, you start thinking about things maybe going on currently in your life, maybe something coming up in the future, the near future. Or, and all of a sudden, you ever been there where you're just thinking about, you know, maybe something, like I said, in the future, and, and all of a sudden you just begin to feel this anxiety, this stress, this worry, this fear begins to grip you and you, and you start thinking about it and all of a sudden the devil starts creating that monster in your mind of, of what's going to happen or what's, what's going to come. And, 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 and I was kind of in one of those moments. It wasn't that anything bad had happened. It wasn't that I had some kind of major crisis. It was actually kind of a slow day and things were just kind of calm and I was thinking maybe too much. And, and in that time of thinking, I just began to feel that anxiety coming on. I began to think about, you know, I began to hear that little voice, the devil saying, hey, you're not going to make it. You know, you had a plan, you had a thought, you had uh, maybe your future planned out, or maybe you had 
this situation. You had figured out how to solve it, and all of a sudden, you know, I threw you a curveball, and now you're not going to make it. And, and it was in that moment I realized that, that the enemy was, was really doing something uh, in my life, capitalizing on a weakness in my own life. Now, now, let me say before I, I give you this this morning, we said this early on in our series, I want to say it again. I realize that when we talk about anxiety, depression, emotional uh, struggles like that, there are a lot of facets to that. They're physical, psychological, uh, hormonal. There's a lot of things that are legitimate that you need you know, maybe different kind of help with, um, and I do understand that. But today I'm speaking strictly from the spiritual point of view. So, so what I want to share with you today is not is not insensitive to uh, those who really have strong battles uh, emotionally in any way. It's not discarding that there are other things involved, but it is pinpointing, at least on the spiritual side, what I believe the enemy does in our life. So I want you to think about the word anxious. Our whole series has been centered around that word anxious. Be anxious for nothing. Have you ever, have you ever noticed what's at the very center of that word anxious if you look at it you'll see it if not uh, I think they'll have it on the screen to help you there it is come on y'all say it real loud what's right in the middle of the word anxious that's right the word I and as I sat in that moment really began to 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 deal with the enemy in my mind all of a sudden the Holy Spirit also uh you, you know stepped in and began to speak and and really was trying to speak to override the voice of the enemy in my life but I began to think about how you know, everything I fear, everything I worry about, everything I stress about is centered around me. You know, what if and how does this affect me? And, 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 and I begin to, you know, we all have been there. You've been there where you, you begin to have that thought, I don't know if I can do this. Or maybe I don't know if I have what it takes. I don't know if I can do this anymore. Come on, anybody ever said that? You, you, you've done it so long, but I just don't know if I can do this anymore. I don't know if I can make it. I don't know if I can take anymore. How many ever said that before? I, look, you know, it's just I, I've had all I can take. I don't know if I, I don't know if I, if I, if I, if I. <laughs> and here's what, what I really realized. I want you to write this down and I'm kind of laying some groundwork for what I believe was a simple, simple word from the Lord, but, but we got to lay a little groundwork. And the first thing I want you to write down is this. At the center of your anxiety, again, I'm speaking from the spiritual aspect of this struggle, at the center of your anxiety is your pride. Because everything you're anxious about revolves around you. I'm fearful of this because if this happens, I am going to suffer this consequence I, i'm i'm stressed about this because if i don't make it then i'm going to go through this it's all centered around us and, and i began to realize that that maybe anxiety is not really the root issue of the matter i began to realize that the reason you can't get rid of the anxiety that you can't get rid of is because you've been bearing a weight that you weren't intended to bear You'll never be able to get rid of that anxiety until you get rid of the weight that's brought that anxiety on. In other words, you're taking more responsibility than you should be taking for the situation in your life. Now, I'm not talking about responsibility in the way that we're responsible for our actions. I'm talking about when you're facing that mountain of a need in your life and you're trying to figure out how it's going to happen and you're super stressed over how that need's going to be met. You're stressed because you're bearing the weight of that need and, and you're, you were never intended to bear the weight of that need. Because how many of you know you can't supply that need? Because if you could supply that need, guess what? You wouldn't be anxious about that need. It would be a thing of the past. You're, you're anxious about that, that, that future uh, happening in your life because you're bearing the weight of, I've got to be sure this happens just like this in my life. When really and truly you have no control over your future in your life. And so here's what I realized, and you can write this down. Your anxiety is the fruit. We've been preaching for a whole series on anxiety, and that's really not the problem. That's the symptom. That's the fruit of the tree. But pride is the root of the tree. In other words, our, our pride, our, our 
our anxiety is really a result of pride in our life. Now, come on, y'all smile for me because everybody's getting a little uptight right now because you're thinking, man, I came for encouragement. You know, I'm going through some stuff, and I'm, I'm stressed, and you're going to tell me I'm prideful. Yeah, that's what I'm going to tell you. But I'm going to help you. God's going to help us realize that, look, this is the, this is the plan of the enemy in our life is, is, is we get all the, look, the world becomes centered around me, and it's all about I. If I can do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm determined to do this, and if I can't make it, then I, and I, and I, and God's saying, hey, get off the throne. You can't solve this problem, but I can. But I can't solve it because you're in the way. Come on, somebody. I mean, I can't get my hands on it because you've got your hands all over it. I can't work it out because you're holding on to it so tight and you've got you've to let me handle this situation. Peter was a man who knew about anxiety and stress and we know the things Peter went through in his life and, and, and he wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, this simple verse that says, humble yourselves. Now let me stop and just say uh, that's something we need to pay close attention to. God's trying to really, really save us some pain when he says, humble yourself. Because here's what I've learned. You're going to be humbled. I'm going to be humbled in my life. I can humble myself or I can be humbled. And let me tell you something. Being humbled is always a lot more painful than humbling yourself. What's the Bible say? Pride comes before what? A fall. When you get prideful, God says, hey, you've gotten on the throne. You're a little high. You don't, how many of you have raised little kids that love to climb everywhere? Becca was our climber, man. She used to climb up walls. I mean, she was like spider girl. I mean, she was all over the place. We had this little uh, hallway in our, in our first home that was where the washer and dryer was, and, and she would literally climb up the wall. It was kind of a narrow thing. She'd climb up the wall and get up high, and we'd walk through, and she'd say, boo, and scare us, and scare us half to death. I mean. She climbed everywhere. Now we have another uh, Ivy's following her steps, climbs everywhere. I see Ivy up and stuff. I'll look up. She's up on top of a counter. I'm like, how in the world did she get up there? And of course, we, you know, for a while would accuse Adeline of putting her up there until we realized, and she would, I promise I didn't do it, but it's becoming a common thing. Adeline comes running in the room going, and I mean, we know when it's serious. She runs in, Mama, 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 Ivy, Ivy, Ivy's up high, her, her. I mean, it's like she's going to kill herself, you know? And that's kind of how we are, man. God looks at us and says, hey, you've gotten too high. You've crawled up too high, and if you fall, it's going to hurt. Get down from there, God says. Humble yourself. Therefore, under God's, come on, mighty hand, and he, that he may lift you up in due time. Get off the throne. Get you off the throne and put God back on the throne in your life. Realize that, you know what, I'm going through a lot of stuff right now, and it's so easy for me to all of a sudden, just because of everything I'm going through, to think I'm the, the world revolves around me. But how many of you understand, the world does not revolve around you or me. We tell our kids that all the time. Hey, get over it. The world doesn't revolve around you. We've all said that to our kids. I think sometimes God says that to you and me, not because he's insensitive. I know what you're going through. I, as a matter of fact, I'm trying to tell you I'm going to take care of what you're going through, but you need to understand that this is life and the, and the world doesn't revolve around you. I mean, man, why am I going through this? Why is this you know, happening to me? Lord, I've done the best I can do, and I've tried to live right, and I've tried to serve you, and I've... Lord, I've spent all these years doing this, and now you're going to let this happen to me? I mean, look, we've got to realize that, that we are not the center of the world. He says, if you'll humble yourself under God's mighty hand in due time. Somebody say due time. That means you've got to go through a little season, but the time is going to come. In, due to, in other words, there is a due date on you being lifted up when you humble yourself under God's mighty hand. You don't want, how many of you understand? If you've been pregnant, you know. Come on, and I'm, I know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm getting into territory I'm not familiar with, but I've been around enough women in my life, to, to a wife and two daughters, that, that I know that 
you know, seen a few babies born and all that. And I know that, that you know, when you're pregnant with a baby, how many of you know the, the longer your pregnancy goes, the more you want to hurry up and have the baby, but you really don't want to hurry up and have the baby because how I many you know if you hurry up and have the baby, there's complications with hurrying up and having the baby. There's a due time for that baby. But every young mother in this place would tell the rest of us that I know there's a due date. I knew that it was basically nine months, give or take. That was my due date. But at about seven months, come on, if I could have had that baby and everything be okay, we'd have had that baby. Because the, the closer your due date gets, come on, I'm helping somebody, the closer your due date gets, the more uncomfortable and painful it becomes. And God's trying to tell us, hey, you're getting close. Just, just humble yourself under God's mighty hand. Because in due time, he's going to lift you up. You know, what you fear today, I believe, can be your testimony of tomorrow. The thing that we're overwhelmed with fear and worry about right now can be God's greatest testimony in your life tomorrow. I want to read you a passage of Scripture. It's found in Matthew chapter 10 and kind of now shift gears. I think we laid a little groundwork. I want to just give you a simple word that I truly believe if you'll receive it, man, it'll change your life. It'll, it'll, it'll set you free from this anxiety and stress that's about to wear you out. It's found in Matthew chapter 10. I'm going to read several verses, but I, at the end of this passage is really the, the, where I want to get to, but you got to back up and read a little bit. Verse 26 says, So do not be afraid of them. Jesus is speaking about a, to the disciples and, and some of the people there about fear and some of the things they were going through and worried about, fearful of. He said, don't be afraid of them, for there's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the rooftops. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. He said, look, you're, you're fearing men right now because you're being persecuted and threatened and attacked and and, and, and you need to realize that, that you don't need to fear man. The only one you need to fear is God. Matter of fact, the Bible says the fear of man will bring a curse into your life. But look at what he says, and here's where I really want to, verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. Somebody say, don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. So here's what Jesus says to them. Listen, guys, you need to stop. Don't be afraid. Don't allow fear to get a hold of your, your, your heart, your mind, your life. Because you need to understand that that two spar you can buy two sparrows for a penny. Now, this doesn't mean a lot to me and you, but back in the day, as you know, when they would go to the temple, they would offer sacrifices, and, and many times they would take doves into the, into the temple as, as, as part of their worship and sacrifice. They were, uh, you know, more expensive. And, and, but sparrows could be bought two for a penny. In other words, even poor people could, could scrounge up enough to do this. They, and, and basically, they were the cheapest of the you know cheap and, and and jesus is speaking now they understand what he's talking about because they're living in that day and age and so they they're in that mindset of you know a sparrow is the is the least valuable bird that there is and jesus says i want y'all to know you already know this you can buy two sparrows for one penny that's not worth much right that doesn't yeah that's right okay i want you to understand that not one sparrow falls from the sky outside of my father's care in other words, even the, the, the least valuable bird that exists cannot fall out of the sky, cannot die, cannot uh, have anything happen to it without God knowing about it first. And, and, and then he says, just to show you how, how deep this is, even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, some of you should thank me because I'm, I'm making God's job a lot 
easier by not making him keep up with a lot of hair on my head. But you know what? Even the very hair, that's amazing when you think about it. Now, I want you to think about, you, you look at me, you think, well, that's pretty easy for you, but think about the world. How many people, I, I have no idea how many hairs are on each person's head, but think about how many heads there are to over 6 billion people in the world. That's a lot of hair. And according to Scripture, God knows every single one of them. And he says, so I want you to understand, if, if a, a bird can't fall out of the sky without God knowing it, and even every hair on your head is, if I know every hair, come on, you don't even know how many hair are on your head. And if you start losing hair, how many of you know you, you really, you know, you begin to maybe focus a little more attention on how, mu how many hairs are on your head. I remember when I first, go, you know, my, my, the men in my family have always gone bald real early. Like, I'm telling you, we were 16, 17, 18 years old. We started losing hair. I started getting the donut up on top of the head at about 18 years old. Now, I mean, that's stressful for an 18-year-old. I mean, I wore caps all the time. I'm like, you know, and all my cousins, all the boys, cousins in my family, always wore caps everywhere because we're trying to cover up the fact that we're getting bald way too early. And when you start losing hair, you start keeping up with how much hair you got. You comb it every way creative you can to try to, you know, the, 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 the gosh, awful comb over. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I went to language school, and we had a guy there, one of our teachers, Mr. Cash. He had all of his hair was from here down on one side. But he combed it from, he let it grow out as long as he could, and he combed it from here all the way over here. It was the worst looking hair that I've ever seen in my life. I don't know why I got on this subject other than I'm, I'm bald. And so, hey, it's interesting to me. But <clears throat> I remember when, you know, I, I lost so much hair. I was real young. I thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wear a buzz cut. I couldn't wear a crew cut because I didn't have enough hair left. But I thought I can get clippers and just buzz it down and at least, you know, it look like it's kind of on purpose. And so I did that for a little while. We were getting ready to go on a cruise one time. I'll never forget it. And uh, Angel said, well, why don't you shave your head? It's like, shave my head? That's like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I mean, <clears throat> what do you mean shave my head? I mean, I'll look like an egghead if I shave my head. And she's like, no, just try it. We're going on a cruise. We're going to be gone for a week. You, you wear a bus cut anyway. If we don't like it, by the time we get back from the cruise, it'll be almost back. Nobody will know. So we, we got to New Orleans. I'll never forget it. We were, actually went down to a Rite Aid or something and bought razor, extra razors and stuff because I'd never done it before. And got in there, and we, <laughs> we shaved my head. The night before we left on the cruise, and I looked at it, and I was, man, I cried. I'm like, this is pathetic. <laughs> I was telling her, what'd you do to me? And she's like, hey, we just tried it, and it'd be all right. You know, she kept saying, it'll grow back in a week. I'm like, yeah, well, great, but right now it looks terrible. And we got on this boat, and we were waiting for the boat to leave, and I'll never forget it. I mean, we had just gotten on the boat, and I was sitting there with Angel, and this lady walked by. And she walked over, and she said, oh, my, can I rub his head? And she goes, well, I guess. And that lady rubbed my head. She said, I just love a bald head. <laughs> I looked at Angel. I said, I think I'll keep it. Hallelujah. Yep, yep. And I never went back. Y'all know what I'm saying? But anyway, <laughs> every hair on your head is numbered. Now look at what he says. Every hair on your head is numbered. So don't be afraid. If I'm not missing what happens to the hair on your head, I'm not going to miss even greater details that are going on in your life. When you think I don't know it and I don't see it, I see it. Jesus repeated three times in that passage, don't be afraid. He started with don't be afraid. Right in the middle of that, he said don't be afraid. And then in verse 31 at the end again, he said don't be afraid. You know what the Lord said to me? Your, your feelings will lie to you. Look, just because you feel afraid, look, Jesus said, don't be afraid. Now, come on, some of you, you're going to get what I'm about to say because you, you, you've been there or you are there. If, one of the most frustrating things is when I tell somebody, I'm stressed, and they say, don't be stressed. You ever wanted to hit somebody that said that? Look, I'm worried. Well, don't worry. It's like, boy, I'll bust you in the mind. What do you mean, don't worry? If it was that easy, I wouldn't be worried. You dummy. I mean, come on, I... I'm scared. Don't be scared. 
Well, Jesus is talking to some people who are anxious and afraid. I overcome with fear, and he says to them, don't be afraid. Well, Jesus, I mean, what do you mean, don't be afraid? That sounds easy. I'm, I'm not trying to be afraid. I'm afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Why, could he, why would he say that over and over to someone who was feeling afraid? Because your feelings will lie to you. And just because you feel afraid doesn't mean you have to be afraid. Just because you feel discouraged doesn't mean you have to be discouraged. Man, look, we grow, but when we're the center of our world, if I'm discouraged, guess what? I put a frown on my face so everybody knows I'm discouraged because it's all about me right now. But, but what about when I'm fighting the biggest spirit of discouragement I've fought in a long time and, and, and I walk out with a smile on my face and, 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 and I say you know what I feel discouraged but I don't have to be discouraged I, I feel afraid but I don't have to be afraid you say well how in the world do you feel something and not be that look we've got to realize there's hundreds of promises in the Bible both in the Old and New Testament reassuring us of God's care, his protection, and his concern for us. This week, when I was going through that moment of, you know, all of a sudden, and I mean, it, it, it quickly could have got, like, really bad for me in that moment, and, and it's like the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and reminded me, listen, uh, you, you need to realize that God's got this. T.C. loves to say that, Pastor T.C., our care pastor. It, when someone uh, texts him with a need or I text him, hey, pray for somebody, they, they're going through this, right? T.C. always says, but God's got this. Well, look, God does have this. There's hundreds of promises in the Scripture, Old and New Testament. Let me just give you a few. I'm Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Come on. Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Oh, look, when they say, hey, there's a hundred people against you, say, well, guess what? God is for me. That's just too bad for them. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us, Romans 8, 37. You're not just a conqueror. The Bible says you're more than a conqueror. I've shared this before, but, you know, I, at one time I was trying to figure out what, what's more than a conqueror. I remember I went to my pastor. I said, look, I read this verse here in the Bible. It says that I'm more than a conqueror. How are you more? I mean, if you're a conqueror, how are you more than that? I mean, that's, that's our goal, right? I mean, what's more than a conqueror? This was back in, in the day, and, and uh, he, he said, well, you know, think about the boxer Muhammad Ali. He's the greatest there's ever been. He flies like a butterfly he stings like a bee he is muhammad ali nobody he, he, you know he he wins that but he's taking some tough punches he comes out of the ring kind of beat up but he but at the end of that match they raise his hands they put the belt on around his waist he's the conqueror he's the champion he gets a check for several million dollars goes home and hands it to miss ali and she's more than a conqueror <laughs> he took the beating but she got the reward and he said, Jesus took the beating for us, but you get the reward. The Bible says you're more than a conqueror. He didn't go through what he went through so you could lose. He went through what he went through so, so he could hand you the reward. Hebrews 13, 5, I'll never leave you. Somebody say never. That means he has not left you no matter what you feel right now. He will not leave you no matter what you fear happening in the future. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Philippians chapter 1. This is the, one of the ones he spoke to me just this week. He who began a good work in you will carry it on until completion. Somebody say completion. If it's not finished, he's going to finish. You just got to say, hey, this, is a, this, this in my life is a work in progress. He's not finished yet. We, come on, look, we, many of us are putting a period where God's put a semicolon in our life. We're saying, well, period, that's it. Look what happened. He says, whoa, 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 I was putting a semicolon. I still got more to write in your story. Matthew 10, verse 30, we just read it. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. So this week, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, man, God... 
I don't know what's going to happen. You know, this just nothing, like I said, no crisis, no problem, nothing happened. It just, I'm just thinking about the future. And the enemy begins to speak, you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. I'm going to mess up all your plans. This is over. And in that moment, here's what I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I want you to write this down. If his eye is on the sparrow, I know he watches over me. Now, those of you who've been around a while, you know that's a hymn. I heard it years ago. I hadn't thought about that hymn in I don't know how long. I hadn't heard the song. But I'm sitting there in a moment, and, that, and, and the, the words of that song come to me. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, whoa. And God says, hey, if I'm watching over the little bird, trust me, I'm watching over you. I sent my son not to die for a bird. I sent my son to die for you. If I care enough about the bird to watch over it, then you can rest assured I sent my son for you, not the bird. I'm sure going to watch over you. And I thought about that for a minute. I felt it. Matter of fact, as bad as I sing, sitting right there by myself, I began to sing that hymn. And as I did, I'm telling you, the Spirit of God began to bring peace into my life. And I thought about that for a minute. And so the word of the Lord is simple, but I believe it's this. If he watches over the sparrow, he is watching over you in every detail of your life. How did he watch over the sparrow? I want you to write down these three things and we'll, we'll begin to close. He is, God is, our purpose. He is our provision. And he is our protector. All these three things came out of this passage. His eyes on the sparrow. Not one sparrow falls to the ground outside of the Father's care. And if he watches over the sparrow, then you don't need to be afraid. He's watching over every detail of your life. So think about this. Not one sparrow falls to the ground outside of the Father's care. I thought, well, what that means is, you know, not one sparrow dies that God doesn't notice that sparrow died. That's not what that passage means. It means that sparrow couldn't fall out of the air unless God allowed it to fall out of the air. It, it goes deeper than the fact that he noticed that happen. Because look, for most of us, that's been kind of the as good as it gets. Well, if I go through something, God knows I'm going through it because he, he saw the sparrow fall from the sky. He sees me. No, what that verse means is not one sparrow falls to the ground outside of the Father's care. That means he had to say, okay, it's time for that sparrow to fall. It can fall. He said, I, I, I don't get it. What I'm saying is, it's, it's not... The, the ultimate is not good news is not well hey he, he knows you're going through it he sees it it goes deeper than that it means that that he allowed you to go through what you're going through because he knew he had you before you ever started going through it the Bible says the devil came to God and said I'm looking for somebody to attack and God said have you considered my servant Job he said, yeah, but you've got this hedge of protection around him. God said, I'll lower the hedge of protection, but this is as far as you can go. And he put limitations on him. Man, we want to focus on how would God allow Job to go through all that he did. We, we don't focus on what we ought to focus on, and that is when God allowed him to go through it, he put limits on the devil before it ever started. And not only that, he put limits on him knowing you can't kill him, and the reason you can't kill him is because i got to do something that's, I'm going to restore two times everything you take from him before the end of the story. He's got to be alive so he can, he can be more than a conqueror at the end of the story. So that means you're going to make it no matter what you're going through. He's your purpose. But it also means he's your provision. Matthew 6 verse 26 says, Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying at a single hour to your life? You know, some of us are worrying about bills we've got to pay that there's no way in, in, in humanly possible we could pay those bills anyway. What are we worrying about? You go, because i got to pay them. If not, they're going to come and, you know, take stuff out from under me. Well... 
I understand that. But the Bible says your heavenly Father takes care of the birds and they, they can't even work or save or put aside. He feeds them. He's going to feed you and me. I told you my life verse has become I've been young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. You know what? God's going to take care of you. He's going to provide for you. I know right now you're figuring, how in the world is it going to happen? Don't worry about it. It's going to happen. It's his responsibility tonight. Get off the throne. Humble yourself under God's mighty hand and say, God, I can't do this. There's, it's way beyond me. I'm just going to bow before you, humble myself, and say, God, I need you to take care of this. And he's also your protector. Not one sparrow falls outside of the Father's care. Psalms 91 says this, those who go to God for safety will be protected by the Almighty. No matter what battle you're fighting, and I'm not talking about just physical, I know most of us hopefully are not, you know, thinking this week who we're going to go out and trade fists with and fight, but you're in the middle, many of you are in the middle of the fight of your life all week when you're in the office, you're at work, you're going through things in your life, maybe, you know, with family and with different ones, and and, and it's like a constant fight, and they're out to get you, and, and they're, you know, everything, they're, they're doing all this underhanded stuff, and, and, and we're thinking, man, I got to defend myself, and I got to fight for myself, and I got to figure out how to, how to one-up, and how to, you know, counterpunch, and, how, and God says, no, look, if you will humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and you go to God for safety, the Almighty God will rise up and protect you. I will say to the Lord, you are my place of safety and protection. You are my God, and I trust you. And look, God will save you from hidden traps and deadly diseases. Come on, look. He's your protector this morning. I sat this week, and I heard the words of that old hymn. His eye is on the sparrow and I know God is watching over me and that's why I sing because I'm happy it's not that I feel happy it's not that everything right now is going great and I'm happy I'm happy because I know if his eyes on the sparrow he's watching over me so I sing because I'm happy and look I sing because I'm free. There is nothing like being free of the spirit of fear and anxiety and depression and worry. And, but how can I? His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he's watching over me. Come on, would you just bow your heads with me this morning? Close your eyes. Oh, God, we come before you right now and. We pray in the name of Jesus. God, for everyone in this service, people facing real needs in their life, crisis situations, people going through right now some real battles in this room. Many of us, God, some of us maybe have no idea how we'll make it through the next week, much less month or year. But Holy Spirit, I pray right now you would remind us of this simple, simple truth. That your eye is on the sparrow. Therefore, we know you're watching after me. That God, you are concerned about even the smallest details of my life. So God, we pray today. And we repent of our pride. Could you just take a minute, right? We just wait on the Lord. Could you just tell him, God, I repent of pride. I've been prideful. Not because I wanted to be prideful, but God, when I'm trying to figure out how to do it myself, I put myself on a plate, you know, on a throne that I should never be on to begin with. So I humble myself today under your mighty hand. And I ask you to be my protector, be my provision, be my purpose. 
I believe the Lord told me to tell somebody just now what you're going through right now is not the end of everything you dreamed of your purpose is not over what you dream maybe your whole life to to see you think I'll never see it God says what you'll see will be way better than what you had dreamed of seeing what I have planned for you is greater than what you had planned for yourself. This is a chapter. It's not the whole book. This is a semicolon. It's not a period. Humble yourself under God's mighty hand. Father, we come before you right now and we humble ourselves. We say, Lord, we need you more than ever. We can't, but you can. So God, we wait on you today and we thank you for it. Just take a moment right now from your heart. Pray to God. If you're here and you say, I need to get right with God, now's the moment to do that. Just tell him right where you are, Lord. I repent of my sins. I repent of my pride. I, I come to you and I say, Lord, I need you more than ever. Many of you who are walking with the Lord, it's still a good time to have a moment of just repentance before God and say, Lord, I know there are a lot involved in my anxiety and my problems, but I do know from the spiritual aspect, God, I'm expected to trust you, believe you, humble myself, and wait on you to do miracles in my life. And I believe you're going to do those miracles in my life. Father, I pray for peace that passes all understanding for each and every one right now. We thank you for it, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Hey, if you would.